Hello and welcome. My name is Gina Sa, and I'm an infectious diseases physician leading our phage therapy program here at Mayo Clinic. I would like to welcome you to our Advancing Care Through Genomics virtual speaker series focused on phage therapy. Today is the last in our four-part series. Dr. William Fabian and Dr. Edison Cano are joining me today as moderators for the event. Dr. Fabian is a professor of medicine in the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology, head of research in the Department of Medicine, and part of the team heading up AI here at Mayo. Dr. Cano is a fellow in the Division of Infectious Diseases, a physician scientist, and a phage therapy expert. Before I introduce our speaker, a few housekeeping items. Please use the Q&A in Zoom to submit your questions, which we will take at the end of the session. For those interested in earning CME credit, an email will be sent within 48 hours <clears throat> that will include instructions on how to claim credit. So we are honored to welcome Cedric Lode as our featured speaker today. Cedric is a researcher currently enrolled in the Ehrenberg Doctoral Program at KU Leuven in Belgium, working jointly in the Laboratory of Gene Technology and the Laboratory of Computational Systems Biology. His background is in engineering and computer science, and he has been focusing on computational biology and its applications in the field of microbiology. Cedric has done groundbreaking work in host virus interactions between pathogenic bacteria and their viruses in the context of therapeutic applications. Cedric's talk is entitled, How Machine Learning Can Help Design Optimal Therapeutic Phage Cocktails. Welcome, Cedric. We are honored and delighted to have you. Thank you very much, Gina. I'm going to start sharing my screen now, and I hope everybody can indeed hear me. And yep. up. Right. Let's see. Okay. So this is working, right? Okay. So uh, first of all, um, hello to everybody. I'm, I'm extremely pleased to be uh, speaking to you today. Originally, this seminar was going to take a more um, interactive form. It was supposed to be organized, I believe, in the month, uh, the summer of 2020, and uh, in presential. So we would have had a chance to, to actually interact one on one. Uh, I'm very grateful to, to the team and to Gina to have uh, transferred this into a webinar so that we can still uh, deliver some of the content that we wanted to talk about. But I realized that this may also preclude some of the interactions that would have taken place in life. So I would like to offer you that uh, if you don't feel like asking your question in the public forum or that you would like to tell me about your research and maybe there is some synergies that can be, um, that can be developed between our, our, uh, our groups, uh, that you contact me. I put my, my email address here at the bottom. Uh, I am not on social networks, but I am pretty responsive on email. So if you shoot me an email, I'll make sure to get back to you and to try to schedule something uh, with you. So uh, I'm here to talk about these actors that you can see on the picture right there. This is a very beautiful picture, which is not from us, but um, we can see on it uh, the two actors that we will be talking about. So we have on the one hand, uh, phage T4, which is a model phage for the bacteria E. Cherichia coli, which is here in blue. And uh, what I'm trying to do mostly is to try to understand how we can predict the interactions between those entities, which are viruses, and their host. And you will see that it's not uh, a trivial exercise. Uh, most of the examples that I will be giving during the talk uh, stem from my own research on Pseudomonas aeruginosa, although we will be uh, talking very briefly about Klebsiella and, and other pathogens that we are also looking, but uh, I'm going to focus mostly on Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And so the purpose of my research is really to try and understand whether we can uh, come up with a way to uh, leverage the abundant amount of, of genomics data and, and in general omics data available uh, together with biological data and, and insights into phage microbiology to better, to better predict, in a sense, the interactions between those two partners here on the picture. And with in mind the prospects of uh, improving the stage of, of the development of, of phage cocktails, therapeutic cocktails, and informing uh, their design. So throughout the talk, you will hear me talk a lot about determinants of host and virus interactions. So I want to give you a few background on that and what I mean by that and, and why should we care about them. So on the one hand, we see that bacteria and phages are not unlike any co-evolving system of prey and predator, which we can see in the natural world. Uh, these systems typically are extremely interesting because they have these uh, offshoot trajectories where 
one is trying to evade the other and the other one is trying to catch up. And so they basically evolve mechanisms to recognize each other or to evade each other. And those are um, you know, what, what we mean by these determinants of host virus interactions. To give you a few concrete examples, here is a sketch of a bacteria and a phage sitting on top of it. On the one hand, we know that phages are essentially mindless particles. They, they float in the environment, in the water or in the soil. They collide with plenty of things, many of which are not are something that they can actually infect. And they need to be able to tell very specifically their host apart from everything else that they come in contact with. And this is typically mediated by interactions between these uh, proteins that are uh, appearing here as the legs of the phage, we call them tail fibers, and structures that are displayed on the outside of the bacterial uh, membrane. And these are typically sugar structures or proteins. And these interactions are extremely specific because in a sense, if you make a slight alteration in the protein coding sequence or in the sugar structure, the phages is no longer able to recognize its host. So these have been really fine-tuned uh, over the eons. There has been a, a huge interest lately in the literature you can find uh, people investigating defense systems, anti-phage defense systems. I believe this stems from the discovery of CRISPR and, and the, the tremendous implications that that had had on, on molecular biology. But in general, we have found a lot of defense systems that the bacteria can use. These are genetic systems encoded on the bacterial chromosome, which once expressed, either reduce or completely prevent a phage infection. Very potent examples of that are CRISPR, as I mentioned, and anti-CRISPR, because for every system that you can think of, or at least for some of the systems that you can think of, there is always a countermeasure that the phage has in place to defeat it or to deactivate it. This is sometimes referred to as an arms race between these two partners. Um, so potent examples are CRISPR and anti-CRISPR or restriction and modification systems. We also know from looking at uh, the infectious process using RNA-seq, so by looking at different time points of the infection of the cell by the phage, that it's not enough that the phage just drops its genome inside the bacterial cell. What we observe is that there is a complete rewiring of the bacterial metabolism for the phage purpose as soon as the infection is triggered. And the purpose of the phage, of course, is to shut down the metabolism part of the bacteria that are not useful for its own purpose, which is to make copies of itself and, and eventually kill the bacteria. There's also been reports of sensing mechanisms through which a bacterial cell that is being infected can warn the surrounding cells through chemicals uh, to, to just get lost and, and you know, uh, try to get away as far as possible and, and evading this, um, this impending doom of the fate infection. So we studied them because on the one hand, uh, we are also interested in biotechnologies and many of these mechanisms that I've described have had tremendous impact on biotechnological um, tools. And, and if you think about molecular biology, many of the examples that we can come up with uh, have at least to some degree a grounding in phage and host uh, and their host uh, microbiology. Some of you may not know this, but for example, CRISPR, which is the famous tool, tool that has been developed in the recent years and which has received, uh, which has been blessed this year with a Nobel Prize, uh, is a, a mechanism that is found in bacterial chromosomes. So this is originally a tool that bacteria use to defeat phages, and that tool has been repurposed uh, by, 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 by humans in order to do genetic engineering and uh, to, to very large success in, 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 in eukaryotes. Closer to my own research settings and probably to your own interest too, what we see is that there is a move in the diagnostic field, be it in hospital or in companies, to use more and more sequencing-based technology for diagnostics. And so we can imagine that in the, and we see that in, in, in cancer genomics or, or for example, in, in infectious disease also, where we can imagine that we can come to a, to a point in time where um, we will systematically be sequencing the pathogens that are infecting the patients and from that information, we could imagine to pick phages. For example, we might have a phage library with thousand isolates, and we want to pick the phages that make the most sense to kill the infectious agent that is uh, infecting the patient. But of course, that has as a premise that you have the time to sequence the genome of the bacteria that's infecting the patient. That's not always the case if you think of septicemia, for example. But there then what we are trying to do is to 
uh, come up with some ground rules that we can use in order to know how we can combine phage into a single product which can be used in those, cage, in those cases. Sorry. You might wonder at this point in the presentation, why, do we, uh, why is it important to actually predict host-virus interactions? Uh, the intuition for most of us are from human viruses, and indeed we don't assume that any significant part of the human population is either immune or insensitive to, for example, HIV or SARS-CoV-2 or the flu. But when you move to the bacterial picture, this changes slightly. So if we focus on the escapes pathogen, uh, which, which we are studying and which are relevant to clinical settings, imagining that you have a representative panel of strains, uh, for example, you have collected a hundred strains of Staphylococcus aureus, maybe you have chosen them in a way that maximizes their, divers their diversity, you can, on the side of that, have your panels of bacteriophage. And you might wonder which phage in your panel will do the most damage, will target most of the strains in that panel. And whether or not you can find a phage like that uh, depends very much on the species that you are looking at. So in Staph aureus, there are some phages that are extremely broad host range. And so if you use that phage, you can target most of the panel of strains that you have uh, in, your, in, your, in your hands. But actually, in the case of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, in our lab, the, one of the best phages that we have can target a bit less than half of the strains. And most of the phage isolates that we have target a few percent of those strains. So it's, it's a very interesting question to wonder you know, what determines that, that host range and what's, what are the parameters that define it. To complicate a bit the picture, uh, we also see that there is, of course, natural variance of phages or phages that can be adapted for therapy. Uh, and this also has an impact on the host range of the phage. So these questions are, are, are not, um, not straightforward to answer. And we believe that one of the reasons this is difficult to do is because there is a tremendous amount of genetic diversity in both actors in that transaction. So if you look on the bacterial side, on the host side, whenever you step away from the typical reference strains that you might work with in the lab and, and look at the panel of strains, it doesn't even need to be that diverse. For example, here I'm illustrating a panel of about 50 strains. They all come from cystic fibrosis patients, all from uh, a single hospital. But when we look at the genetic content of those strains and we try to highlight what are the genes encoded in those genomes, we can readily see that those genes can be split into two data sets. There are some genes that are core and which, um, as, as their name implies, you are going to find those genes on every genome in that data set. They are present in all of them. However, this core genome is, is typically less than half of the genome size of the bacteria. So you can imagine that this core genome is heavily decorated uh, by these accessory genes, which, which form, in a sense, the personality of the typical strain of the strain that you are investigating. Uh, these accessory genes are present to some degree in some strains and not some others. Some are very present, some of them are less, but by definition are not core. I will come back to them a bit later. At the moment, I would like to focus on the core genes and what we can do with them. So the core genes are interesting because with them, we can build population structure. So we can try to look at our data set and between every pair of isolates that we have in our data set, we can calculate an evolutionary distance. So we can relate them on the phylogenetic level and build, for example, a tree like the one I have illustrated here. What's interesting for us uh, is to make sure that indeed our strains are diverse and that they represent, even though we work mostly with clinical strains, that they represent the diversity of the species Pseudomonas aeruginosa as a whole. And indeed, when we do this exercise on our private strains, we recognize the group structures that have been published uh, before by people who are looking at environmental data sets, for example. If we move now to the, phage of this, uh, the side of the phages, sorry, uh, there we have a little bit more complications because phages have had multiple origins and they can't really be related on the tree of life uh, as the other domains of life can. So what we resort to instead are these kind of techniques where we are comparing proteomes to proteomes. So here is a network. Every dot on that network is a phage. And whenever they are connected, that means that there is a similarity between their proteome. If they are further distant, it's less similarity. If they cluster together, they are more similar. And indeed, you can appreciate that there is some clades of phages here at the bottom that are completely disconnected from the main network because they are uh, indeed uh, not relatable in terms of their, their genetic content to the other phages. 
Again, one of the things that we want to assert here is that by some misluck, we are not working with phases that all come from a single place. So we try to target uh, the different groups on that network and take our isolates from there. These, uh, I mentioned briefly in the previous slide, these accessory genes, and I want to uh, give you a few concrete examples of what they are and, and why they are important as determinants of interaction. So I mentioned CRISPR. This is a figure that I will use a few times with different systems. You have at the center about 90 strains of Pseudomonas aeruginosa that have been organized. This is a phylogenetic tree, so they have been organized by their evolutionary distance. And surrounding it, you have these annotations um, that are the other rings of this uh, visualization. And basically what we did there is to try to detect in each of these genome, which were the CRISPR-Cas systems that were present. We know that there is at least four different types of CRISPR-Cas systems in Pseudomonas aeruginosa, so we try to find them. And you can directly appreciate, at least visually, that indeed those systems, even though they could be very important for the bacteria to have in terms of phage defense, they are by, by uh, visually, you can appreciate that they are indeed accessory. Not all of them are, not all of the strains have these, uh, these CRISPR systems. You might also see here that there is some anti-CRISPR proteins. You might wonder why that is the case. Why would a bacteria carry an anti-CRISPR protein? This is typically something that a phage would use to, def to defeat a, a CRISPR-Cas system. The reason is that if you look where those genes are located inside the bacterial genome here, uh, you will find them inside a prophage. A prophage is essentially a phage that instead of killing the bacteria, uh, decided to integrate its genetic content inside the bacterial chromosome. And so these CRISPR, anti-CRISPR proteins are located on that accessory content. I mentioned new systems that have been discovered. There was a seminal publication a few years ago from the group of Rotem Sorek in the Weizmann Institute, where they basically identified about 10 new systems which could really be linked to phage infectivity. So their presence in any given genome has an impact on whether a phage or not can infect that specific bacteria. And so you will see that indeed these systems originally uh, investigated in Bacillus and I believe uh, Escherichia were are present in Pseudomonas aeruginosa, but they are again uh, appearing to be optional. Not all of the strains have it. So they are part of this accessory content that I was telling you about. An important determinant factor are these uh, prophages. Uh, in virology, you, you have this concept of super infection exclusion by which a virus that is infecting a cell will prevent further virus from infecting the same cells. In a, in a sense, it will protect its own territory until it can complete its infection. So in prophages, you also have these, um, these concepts of superinfection exclusion. So we know that some prophage can exclude other prophages, but also uh, exclude virulent phages. And this is something that we are uh, really interested in and, and trying to, to look at on a very large scale at the moment. But again, you can appreciate that these prophages are, I mean, by definition, of course, they are mobile elements. So indeed, they will be present in some strains and, in not, and not in some others. And you can appreciate that again visually. They are widely distributed in Pseudomonas aeruginosa. This is, this is not really typical of that bacteria. Many bacteria are like that. Uh, prophages are a common staples of genomics uh, in, in bacteria. And the central thesis of our research, if you want to, to sketch it in one slide, would be this that we have on the one hand, a tremendous amount of genomics information. So we have access to a lot of public databases. The problem there is that this is genomics data for which we don't have access to the isolates themselves, or we would have to contact the labs that have published them in order to have them. So on the side of that, we also have our custom private data set of about a thousand now uh, strains of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And you can imagine that we've sequenced them all. Uh, some of them were given to us uh, kindly from, you know, uh, other groups that have published their results, but we can imagine that we have all this genomics data and we try to very carefully annotate it. We try to not only annotate genetic features like genes and protein coding sequences, but we also focus on multi-genic systems such as prophages, uh, defense systems, and, and other things like that. And that's very important to us because those features are going to be used as predictor variables for our machine learning exercise. So the machine learning tools are going to be using those annotated features as predictors for, for, the, for the exercise. If you are not familiar, you will hear me talk a lot about features and predictors. Uh, you 
you can imagine that, for example, if you are trying to predict the height of an individual, there are some variables that would be good to know in order to make a good prediction. For example, you can think of what is the age of the person, whether it's a, it's a male or a female, and whether and what country it comes from, because that also has an impact. So those three predictors, which are the, the age, the, the sex, and then the country of origin, for us, we use the features, these, um, these annotated uh, functions on the genomes of the bacteria as predictors. We also have, of course, as I mentioned, the, the phylogeny of our population. And in, in essence, you can imagine that you, you develop this huge data set, which is essentially a tabular data set where you have all of your bacterial isolates as, col as lines in the data set, and then you have these annotations as columns. And with respect to that, we also have uh, the phage infectivity data. So we have different phages and we try to infect different strains with those phages and record whether or not they were successful to infect. I will come back a little bit to that later. But in a sense, this uh, is a very nice playground, it's a very nice data set that you can then you know, use modern statistical technique to try to mine signal and see whether there is some predictive features in the data set. Of course, this is uh, challenging and this is really a feature of our time that we are crawling uh, under um, so much data that is being dumped on us um, permanently. And it seems that it's always expanding. And indeed, that's an intuition that is confirmed by, by data analysis. For example, uh, an interesting figure tells us that um, about 90% of the total amount of data that exists today in the world was created only in the past two years. So we are really in a, in a very strong exponential growth of data. And if we bring it back home to our own setting uh, by Illumina's own estimation, so the company Illumina who makes the sequencer can see you know, how many sequencers are in operation and the reagents that they are selling, they estimate that indeed omics data is also in exponential growth and doubles every 12 months. And, and to tell you the truth, from our own experience in our lab where we've implemented sequencing in the past couple of years, we've really been uh, now uh, dealing with increasing demand on, on sequencing. So we've really seen this exponential demand uh, on, on the sequencing side. But of course, dealing with so much data also has its uh, downside. And this is a cartoon that, that you may have seen before, which uh, we find interesting, which uh, essentially shows us that uh, as researchers, we are you know, bombarded with new publications every week, with new sequencing data sets available, the public database is growing at a steady pace. And so we have a lot of information available and it becomes very hard sometimes to make sense of it. So as, as we gather more information, our level of confusion also grows. And what we are trying to do really is to, to say, okay, this is, this is really a feature of our time that this amount of data is always going to increase in the future. So we should be dealing with it. And hopefully by integrating these, um, you know, these processes into our operations that are you know, collecting biological data and making, making these models, we can actually learn from them and basically tame the dragon of complexity that we have you know, built as, as researchers. Uh, we use for that uh, typical machine learning workflows. This is, uh, it looks like a, a straightforward linear pipeline, but actually many of these steps feed on each other. And uh, what is interesting to people who, who don't really do machine learning to know is that uh, basically we spend 90% of our time in here, in those two boxes at the top. These three boxes here, unless you have really huge amount of data, um, usually this is largely automated and you can uh, uh, rely on some very good infrastructures for computing and this can be uh, very fast iterations. But here basically uh, that's something that, uh, that you spend a lot of time on. If you are interested in this, uh, to look at, at this a bit further, there is a very nice book from Thomas Davenport called The AI Advantage. It's a management book, so it's, it's a lot of advice for people who are dealing with, uh, I mean, a lot of examples stem from hospital management and from research groups and things like that, so, and, and industry. So a very interesting read if you, if you want to know more about this. To come back to our, to our research setting, what we are trying to predict is this infectivity. So how do we survey that in the first place? Uh, we use, for, for those of you who are not familiar with page biology, uh, we use a very standard assay called a plaque assay, in which what we do is that we, we have uh, a layer of agar that is, for example, in a Petri dish, and we contaminate with uh, a single isolate, a single bacteria. The bacteria will grow inside the agar and will make it uh, turbid. And basically what we do is that we spot dilution series of our viruses on top of that agar as, it's, as the bacteria is growing 
And uh, you can appreciate, for example, here visually that something is happening with those three first viruses, but this fourth one here uh, does not result in any observable phenotypes. And the, the, the phenotype that we are looking for are these plaques here that you can see these small uh, dots here. What, what does it mean to see a plaque? It's essentially that as the bacteria was growing, it encountered a phage that we had uh, spotted there. And that phage was able to infect the bacteria, make a full replication cycle and infect the surrounding bacteria as they were also growing. And so as in, at the macroscopic level, what you observe is these, uh, these clearings in the bacterial lung. And so this is uh, something that we try to collect as, as biological data. And you can imagine that you can record this in tables. So you have either uh, yes or no uh, answer. So you can imagine that you have binary vectors um, that summarize what you have observed, but you can also count the number of plaques that you see here because that gives you a certain uh, amount of, a certain idea of the potency of your phage on that specific isolate. So we collect both in parallel, but here I'm gonna focus on the yes or no answers. And when you have collected such data, one question that uh, comes up of course is, how do you visualize it? How can you see whether there is some patterns in there that, that are useful to mine? And one such visualization is to a straightforward heat map here uh, on a smaller part of our data set with about 90 isolates of bacteria organized by their phylogenetic signal. And then here we have the phages, about nine phages. And whenever you see an orange tile, that means that that specific phage and specific bacteria interacted and, and we saw plaques essentially. And of course, our eyes want to see pattern in this, but uh, we try to find techniques that make this analysis a little bit more systematic. So one of the things that we turn to is uh, a, a technique called association rules mining. This is uh, a technique that stems from the field of, of marketing, where you can imagine that you have a, 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 the owner of a store which is selling a certain amount of item. And every day there are consumers that come in and they fill in their basket and they buy different products. So at the end of the month or at the end of the year, the, the, the owner has a list of all the transactions, for example, with client one bought wine, cheese, no ham and some bread. And so you can imagine that this is a, a tremendous amount of data, at least if you are thinking of stores where, where everybody goes shopping. Uh, and the question that you might legitimately ask about this, um, this data set is whether there are some items that are frequently bought together uh, or whether there is some items that are never bought together. And, and, and I, guess, I guess a straightforward example would be some people like Pepsi and some people like Coca-Cola. So you would see that indeed they buy one or the other, not both at the same time. And this uh, technique is interesting because it generates, uh, it's, it's very exploratory. So you can really explore the data set. It's going to generate a lot of rules, which are associations between items. And you will have to kind of, you know, look at them and, and investigate them a little bit. So through data analysis, typically the, the result of these analysis are graphs and they have different rules. This is a very uh, simple graph, but each rule has an antecedent. So for example, this rule tells us that if the customer bought wine, then the customer also bought cheese. And the rule number two tells us that if the customer bought bread, then he also bought cheese. Uh, depending on the, the part of the world where you are coming from, this may or may not make sense to you, but uh, in, in Belgium, that certainly makes sense. Um, so we try to use this technique uh, to our own data set. And so the questions that, that we are asking then are not so much about uh, you know, consumer products, but more, you know, do we see that there are some phages that tend to infect the same types of hosts and whether or not there are some phages that are complementary in infection profiles. So one interesting thing with this technique is that it doesn't need any more information than just you know, these patterns of zeros and ones. So you don't need to input any information about the taxonomy, about the phylogeny or, or other things like that. And typically what you get as an output, as I have mentioned, is these uh, networks of, of rules. And you can imagine that uh, there are some rules that are found very, very frequently in the data set and there are some that are not very, very frequent. If you go back to the store example, you might say that, for example, the association between bread and cheese you see that in a lot of consumer baskets. That's something that is very common. So you have a lot of support for that role. But imagining that you have a customer that comes in and buys a computer keyboard and a bottle of water, uh, well, probably that doesn't happen very often. And if it does, that doesn't really reveal anything profound about human nature. Um, so we have to filter those rules and kind of make sense of them. And when we do, uh, there are some in very interesting results that we, that we get from that is that 
On the one hand, we kind of recapitulate taxonomy. So we see that phages from a certain clade uh, tend to infect the same types of hosts. And more interestingly, what we see is that there is some exclusion pattern. So if we have phages from a certain clade that can infect the bacteria, then phages from another clade cannot and vice versa. And this is interesting for the reason that if you think about designing phage cocktails, that means that if you put those two phages together into a single product, the product will have a broader host range than either of these, either of these phages separately. So this is something that we, are, uh, that we are looking into a lot into our data set because uh, this, this could provide us with some kind of ground rules uh, in the design of phage cocktails. Um, as I mentioned, one of the things that we really uh, try to focus on uh, uh, until now, I, I've mentioned it, but I have not yet uh, talked about uh, what it is that we are, are trying to predict. Um, this process of phage infectivity is essentially a biological process. And we imagine that it has an input and the input of that is a phage and a bacteria. And the output is whether or not we saw a successful infection, whether or not we saw a plaque in our assay. Of course, this is a process that is happening on a very grand scale on the planet. Um, it's estimated that about half of the bacteria are killed every day by phage activity. So we can't observe it as a whole, but we of course can collect data on our specific pathogens and phage. And using that data, which essentially uh, contains both the question and the input, so this phage and this bacteria, but also the answer, yes or no, they were able to, to infect we can actually use that to train a model. And we do that via a technique called supervised learning, where you have uh, a model that takes some parameters and you have an algorithm that trains those parameters based on these questions and answers. So it, it asks the question, it sees the answers, it then fine tunes the parameters so that it gets the right answer. And then it sees more data and, and this process is happening iteratively. Once you have done this exercise, of course, then you can take a new input and make a prediction from it and verify you can either go into the lab, for example, and test whether the prediction was actually correct. Or what, what typically people do in machine learning is that they collect a batch of data and then they set aside part of it, typically one third. And that third never enters the model during the training. It's something that you set aside and the model cannot see it. It has some data to train itself. And then you can test the model on that, that data that you've set aside. And this gives you very important information because some of these models in machine learning can essentially just memorize your data set. So if you give it a lot of data, it can actually memorize everything. And so you are making predictions just based on past observation, but you are not generalizing to new observations that you will want to make in the future. In terms of the models, there are two categories that are useful to think about them at least. Um, there is the black box category and the white box. And what we mean by that, these black box models are um, very flexible. They can really capture uh, high degrees of non-linearity. If you have a process that is very complex and you don't know what's the shape of it, these models might work very well to capture you know, the, the underlying distribution of the data. Um, and you also have uh, the problem with those models is that they, they don't really allow you to introspect um, the, the results themselves. So you make a prediction and you have no idea what was important in that model to make the prediction. I will come back to that a bit later, as opposed to the white box models where you have indeed, um, you, you, you are more biased, you are saying my data is probably distributed you know, linearly or following a decision tree or something like that. And so these models have more, more structure. Um, however, the, the good side of those models is that you can actually introspect them. So you can go back into the model and see, you know, of all the features that we have, so, you know, these, these genomic systems and, and the profit and things like that, what were the ones that were actually important to make a prediction? Uh, so you can rank the parameters in terms of the importance in prediction. Uh, so when we do that, you, you have to realize that we don't really develop new uh, machine learning techniques in this lab. We are, uh, we, we leave that exercise to, to computer scientists and people who are developing new methodology in machine learning. It's a complex exercise. And we use toolboxes that are available to us um, from, from other researchers and standard algorithms for machine learning. Uh, so when we do that, we can actually, once we have cleaned data, which I, I, I refer to as the step where you spend most of your time in this machine learning workflow, once you've cleaned the data, actually, you can really try many different types of models uh, 
very automatically. You can write a script and, and, and iteratively try different models and see what, how they perform uh, in terms of prediction. <clears throat> and so if we think about these black box and white box models, you can actually come up with a, um, you know, a best, best, um, best model for each of these categories. And when we do that, indeed, we find that uh, for our data set and our way of, of modelizing the data, support vector machines seems to be a very good uh, tool. And in the white box model, we used uh, random forest, which was one of the best uh, predictors that we could uh, get. And we see that as expected, um, the, well, it, this is not uh, natural, of course. I mean, this, this is uh, after the fact we expected indeed that uh, the black box model would perform slightly better, but indeed um, that's the case. So this does not really confirm anything, but it, it at least gives us a clue that indeed what we are trying to model uh, is very complex and it's, it's highly nonlinear. So these models that are able to capture these, these patterns in the data are better uh, at it. Um, I mentioned in the title here that there is a, a, a trade-off between uh, infectivity, or between, sorry, performance and interpretability. So what do I mean by that? It, it really depends on the setting in which you are. So if you are thinking about um, hospital, for example, and you just want to make a prediction, uh, yes or no, which phage I should use. You don't really care so much, uh, you know, why should you use that phage? You care that uh, the algorithm predicts the right phage to use. But as, as molecular biologists and in our, in our group, we, are, we care a lot about phage microbiology. We want to learn from these models, you know, what are the features on the bacterial chromosome or on the phage chromosome that are actually important to make predictions because those are potentially proteins and genes that we can uh, use to our own uh, advantage later on. Of course, you don't really have to make a choice. As I mentioned, the steps of modeling, testing, and training uh, are actually automatable. You can, you can actually automate them very, very easily. And as long as you don't have a huge amount of data, it's feasible to train different models at the same time in parallel. So you don't really have to pick uh, your category here. You can just do both in parallel. One thing that's interesting from this modeling exercise that we have noticed is that uh, this is, by the way, a rock curve. This is a standard way of reporting the characteristics of a classifier. So this is a classification problem because we are asking the question, can this phage and this bacteria interact, yes or no? So it's a classification problem. And basically what this rock curve tells us uh, here on the diagonal, this dotted line here, is a model that would be uninformative. So where uh, basically the training exercise was not useful, you are not learning anything from it, you are still making uh, predictions which are mostly wrong. And as soon as you depart from that, uh, you are making improvements on that. So we are happy because of course our, our model kind of works. We, we show that uh, we are departing from random predictions and we can indeed predict to some degree interaction between phages and bacteria. But something that you don't really see here, or at least it's a bit difficult to see, but there are actually two curves there and they are basically hugging each other. And the reason is that uh, these two models were both built with support vector machines. But in one case, we included as features uh, the core genes and in the other, we didn't. So we only included the accessory genes. And what we see is that with our current modeling technique, we are not taking into account the core genes at all. They don't have any predictive value. We think that this is rather true. These core genes are present in all of the, of the isolates, so we don't think they bring any information on predicting interactions between phage and bacteria. However, there might be something there. There might be some genes that, you know, they are considered core, but they are actually a variation of one another and the variation might make, uh, might be important. So we are still thinking a little bit about that. What we also see is that there seems to be some limitation to the modeling approach that we are using at the moment with these uh, features. Because as we increase the amount of data that we use in order to train our model, we see that the marginal returns start to decrease. And so in order to make an improvement on the model, you need really a large amounts of data. Um, and, and potentially you are not going to learn much more. So we've now, uh, of course, started to think about the version two of these models. And I will say a bit more about that in the next slides. And one thing that I wanted to also mention is that uh, these white box models are pretty important to us, as I said, because we want to understand phage biology. And what we can do is we can actually introspect those models and see which are the top predictors that we can extract from, from, the, from a random forest, for example, once it has been trained. And what we see is that in the top 10 extracted features, we directly recognize some uh, already known 
uh, predictors of interactions, so determinants of host virus interactions. We have a link to CRISPR. We have some structural proteins of the phage, which are, for example, the tail fibers, very important to recognize their host. We have new putative phage receptor, which were not identified in Pseudomonas, but in another bacteria, uh, another bacterial metabolism enzyme. But we also have there, of course, uh, genes that are unknown at the moment. They are hypothetical proteins. However, they seem to be important to predict uh, phage infectivity. So what we hope is that this process can also feed back into the molecular biology, which is you know, the people who are giving us the data, of course, um, so that we can also generate hypotheses for them of proteins that might be interesting to investigate further. Until now, what I've told you is that we are basically looking at strains that we have isolated from, for example, or received from, from the hospital. And those strains, we, we consider them as wild type strains. They are strains that we receive and then we test the bacteriophages on them and we record whether or not these uh, bacteria can be infected by the phages. But indeed, uh, you can actually be much more uh, purposeful or much more directing in your effort because you can actually say the other way around, instead of saying, I have my bacteria and these are all the features that I have, I don't know which ones are important. I'm just gonna go through this exercise of predicting you know, with these machine learning tools. You can actually zoom in on some of the features and how would you do that? Uh, that's an experiment that we are doing uh, at the moment with the lab of Susanna Druliskawa in Poland, which is to basically select a few clinical isolates, you know, grow them in planktonic forms and in biofilm forms, then expose them to phage pressure. And what you can observe readily, this is a general thing in, in phage biology, is that you can always uh, in, uh, evolve mutants, uh, bacteriophage insensitive mutants, so bacteria that, that resist to phage. And so when we do that systematically with many different phages and, and cocktails or combinations of phages, and then we basically evolved a, a large number of mutants. Of course, the question is now, whether all these mutants are really going to be different. It's very likely that actually, if there is a straightforward way to evolve resistance against a given phage, if you repeat the same experiment multiple times, you will just use the same pathway all over again. So the first thing that we did was to, to look at uh, maximizing phenotyping difference. So we measured multiple parameters about the, about the bacteria, and we tried to find bacteria that are resistant to phage, but um, very are very different in terms of their uh, phenotypes. By doing so, we were able to reduce down the, you know, the data set of mutants to 235 strains, which we then put for, for sequencing in order to really see you know, what was happening on the genome of those bacteria that caused resistance uh, to the phage. Um, this gave us uh, a very interesting data set because now we have basically a, a lens or a magnifier where we can essentially look through the genome of the bacteria, what are the features that are being mutated in order to prevent phage infection. And of course, that's, that's a huge information when you are thinking about modeling this process, because these, these, um, these features are indeed biologically linked now to, uh, and you can link them back to this experiment, uh, by directly linked to the phage infectivity process. We've also seen that that's something that I will briefly mention again later, which is that uh, you do see mutations in terms of small nucleotide differences, but you also see rather large genomic deletions or, or things that are happening that cannot really be captured by Illumina technologies. We have done this work, again, this is driven by the lab of Susanna Driskawa in Poland, uh, in Pseudomonas and in Klepsiella. Both are uh, currently under review. So another technique that we could use to zoom in on features that are important to phage infectivity is something that we have done in the past in the lab a lot. There was a student, uh, Bob Blasdell, who did a lot of RNA-seq experiments in the lab. So he systematically infected bacteria with uh, different phages and looked um, at different time points of the infection. We call them early, middle, and late infection. What was happening to the transcriptome of both the phage and of the bacteria? Uh, when you do that, of course, that gives you a little bit of a zoom in on the phage genome itself. This is a, a jumbo phage, and we can see all the features of the phage, and we can actually sometimes tell apart which are the features that are expressed very early on in the infection. And those genes are, of course, key to converting the bacterial metabolism. So that gives us a further lens that we can use to, uh, to integrate biological data into our models. What Bob did was also to infect a host, the same bacteria with many different Pages and looking again at the, what was happening to the transcriptome. And doing so, what he identified was that there was a common host response, even though those phages 
are, are very different in nature. Uh, when you look at the features that are manipulated by the phage upon infection, some of them seems to be conserved across multiple phages. And again, this is another set of features. This is about 200 genes that have been identified in that manner, which we could use to further refine our model uh, by inputting, in a sense, biological meaning to some of the features that we have. Um, <clears throat> I would also like to say very briefly that it's important to realize that if you are looking at the bacteria undergoing adaptive evolution within a patient, uh, it's important to realize that genome is a dynamic thing. And this is something that we've seen recently on a pathogen called Burkholderia multivorans. This is a cystic fibrosis pathogen, where we see that by combining sequencing technologies, this is also a question that's uh, coming up a lot lately, uh, what is the purpose of, of doing you know, combination of sequencing technology? The purpose is that you then get a full resolution of the chromosome and you can see things that you would have missed otherwise. Uh, for example, you can capture large genomic uh, variations, so not only SNPs, but also things that are moving inside the genome and potentially deactivate or, or activate genes. And many of these things have been linked, not specifically in Burkholderia multivariance, but they have been linked to phage infectivity. So it's important to keep that in mind that uh, it's, it's not enough to have the first isolate in a series of isolates during phage therapy treatment. You actually need to follow up on what are the changes that happen to the bacteria once it's inside a patient and undergoing you know, adaptive evolution or pressure from antibiotics or, or what, whatever you throw at it. Um, finally, there is one case that I wanted to briefly mention, which is uh, very precious to us because we don't really have a lot of examples of uh, the pathogen evolution during the phage therapy treatments. So this is um, a series of isolates that we have from a, a very young patient, 1.5 years old, who developed a septicemia after a uh, transplant liver and um, was administered uh, intravenously a cocktail of phage that is developed uh, at the lab of, of Pirnay in Belgium uh, and produced there, and which really resulted in, 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 uh, in life-saving uh, results of the therapy. And what we have collected there is again this, this idea that we, we are seeing these bacteria inside the patient at different time points of the infection because the bacteria was at first eliminated by the phage cocktail, then it reappeared, then it was again eliminated. The, the intravenous treatment lasted for 85 days, so the bacteria appeared a few times during those, but eventually completely disappeared, was cleared from, uh, from the blood cultures at least. And again, what we can see is that the initial isolate is indeed sensitive to the phage cocktail, but some of the isolates that we got along the way were not sensitive anymore, even though this is a clonal bacteria, we established uh, that through, through, through genomics analysis. And what we could see is that there were key mutations in the genomes of those insensitive isolates that explains why the cocktail was not working anymore. So luckily, what, what we assume, of course, is that um, the bacterial load was greatly reduced thanks to the phage cocktail and indeed uh, the immune system or other treatments took over and, and restored health in that patient. And finally, as a, as a conclusion slide, what I would like to, to mention is that um, you have heard, I think, uh, in the last meeting, uh, Jean-Paul Pirnet talk about the, the approach that we have now in Belgium of doing uh, phage therapy, which relies on on this idea of having a uh, phage bank and, and a production environment, which um, certification authorities can guarantee are produced uh, according to a certain monograph. And then these products end up in a hospital pharmacy and uh, they can then be prescribed to the patient depending on, on the case that you, are, that you are working with. So in Leuven, we are really trying now to bring this uh, phage therapy to life. And I'm really happy because uh, first of all, because of course we are all very interested to see phage therapy develop further and, and actually you know, um, uh, be, be a standard technique to treat patients, but also because the bioinformatics part, everything that I've explained to you until now has been completely integrated in that multidisciplinary phage task force so that we can be a part of it and we can interact with the clinicians and with the people who are developing these cocktails of phage and inform them through our bioinformatics experience and the data that we have collected so far, we can uh, request of them, uh, you know, specific time points on which to collect pathogen to see the evolution of it when it is being under phage pressure. We can try to predict um, the infectivity of uh, these phagograms, which is the equivalent of, of uh, an antibiogram, using the techniques that I have highlighted. And especially we can collect again information in vivo, so in actual cases of phage therapy that could inform uh, phage cocktail designs. So this is a really exciting development. Uh, that is happening at the moment and I'm really uh, happy to be a part of it.
So with that, uh, I have a ton of people to thank. And I have been blessed with many excellent collaborators. So many of them are listed here, but not all. I apologize for that. Um, if you are there listening, I, I hope that uh, you know that I appreciate, appreciate your collaboration very much. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I will stop sharing my screen. I am so grateful for your time today and the effort that you went through putting together this talk. It was clear, compelling. Um, and for many folks, for me, that's not that uh, well versed in phages, it was illuminating. And I think for folks that don't do a lot of um, advanced analytics, I think that that also was, was quite clear and illuminating. So I'm grateful. Um, how about, uh, I, I'll read off the first question and then Edison, do you want to get the next one? I've got, we've got the a q and I've got some questions as well, but we might as well move to what's in the Q&A here. I'm just going to go straight down the list. So the first is from Jimmy Buckertz. Is a simple prediction output of yes or no useful in practice? Hmm. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question. Of course, what, what the setting that we are looking at at the moment is uh, whether or not we can come up with an analytical technique that based on the background, the genomic background of a strain and of the specific bacteriophage uh, predicts whether or not they infect. Of course, there is more information to be gathered and we are trying to, uh, to, to understand you know, how to also input into that the potency of the phage because that's also something that we record. If you remember, I mentioned that we record these as vectors of yes or no, they can infect, but indeed we really want to understand also what is the impact of uh, the potency of the phage on that specific strain? Because we know, for example, that many of these defense systems, they don't really completely eliminate the possibility of a phage to infect the bacteria, but they reduce the potency of that infection. So this is something indeed that we are looking, but this is really on a, on a phage by phage basis. Uh, we can't at the moment really uh, consider that in our model. And can I just ask a brief follow on to that then? How much more complicated does the modeling become if you no longer have a binary answer, yes or no? So the, the problem is that you are switching indeed from a binary prediction to a continuous uh, prediction. And SVM does accommodate that. So the, we, we could imagine that indeed we could try again our, our support vector machine um, modeling tool. And instead of, of predicting a classifier uh, to predict yes or no answers, you can also train it to predict uh, an actual continuous value, but we haven't tried that. The idea for us at the moment is really to try to, to do that on a phage by phage basis and showing whether or not we can find in the bacterial genome what are the features that determine the potency of the phage infection. Thank you. Great, well, thank you very much for that question. And then I'm gonna go with the second question here from Marcin Luboki. Uh, these are, this is actually a three, three part question. Um, so, starts with, is the ability to block super infection unique to temperate phages? That's question number one. Then, is a lytic phage able to block other lytic phages from entering cells? And then the third one, should we take this into account when composing a phage cocktail so that the two lytic phages are not mutually exclusive? What do you have to say about that, Cedric? It's a really cool question. Um, so I have a partial answer to that, which is that when we look at, um, so when we try to infect the cell with a bacteriophage, we can explore what is happening inside the cell using transcriptomics. And we can look at different time points of the infection you, you, and see what are the features that are regulated, upregulated, downregulated on the bacterial genome. And interestingly, what we see is that if the phages use a certain promoter, a certain, for example, uh, receptor binding protein, which is a protein that is displayed on the bacterial membrane, sometimes the phage upon infection will actively downregulate or actively regulate, upregulate the destruction of that specific component. So I do think that lytic phage do try to some degree to prevent further copies of themselves from infecting uh, the same bacteria. So that basically they are the master of their territory and they can uh, stay in control of the cell until they have completed their, re their replication cycle. I think there is some evolutionary pressure to achieve that. I guess that's one question. Yeah, so in summary, it sounds like the lytic phages are these predatory, um, yes. you know, looking like phages. Yeah, that, that sounds uh, interesting. Uh, I think that summarizes the three, the, the three uh, questions. So indeed, that's something that we see in terms of um, 
of RNA transcriptomics, but it's a, a bit more difficult to prove, um, you know, using uh, using assays that could be specifically targeting this question. There is indication. An interesting question about uh, uh, synthesizing new phages. Um, I'm sure you've considered this. Um, implications and possibilities of using uh, your machine-based learning tools to engineer new phages. Mm -hmm. Yes, and indeed, that's a, that's a project that, that has started. It has paused a little bit. That's a simple example of it, actually, where we are trying to integrate the insights that we are getting from these uh, prediction tools. Um, I mean, the idea, I don't know, there is a very interesting paper from, from Pigme about this, which is the, the vision on 2035 of phage therapy. And he's talking specifically about that. So indeed, that is something that we are, we are looking into at the moment. The problem is that Printing a page genome, even a small one of course, is just uh, very prohibitive in terms of cost. So, um, you know, we might play with the idea, but it will be difficult at the moment to really engineer page uh, sequence. Thank you. Yeah. Great. So, um, Dr. Fabian, do you mind if I if I take an another one? Absolutely. That yeah, we're alternating. Go for it. Okay, great. So I. Um, I think these are coming up at different times, but I, I'm going to pick this one from John Paul. Uh, to what extent are phage resistant bacterial mutants selected in the lab in vitro relevant for phage resistant bacterial clones selected in vivo? That's probably a complex question, but what do you think, Cedric? In the lab relevant. So, indeed, the, the, the idea of, of this. Um, experiment that we are doing in vitro in the lab is to be very deliberate in, in exploring what are the features of the bacterial chromosome that once evolved or mutated impacts the phage infectivity, right? So I think that there are multiple uh, impacts of that. First of all, what we see is that uh, some phages share receptors. So meaning that if you infect with a phage, and of course you evolve in vitro the resistance to that single phage um, via mutation, it's possible that another phage that uses the exact same receptor will also become, ins or the bacteria will also become insensitive to that. So through these experiments, we also gather information about that at least, that we can see that uh, some phages by, by the bacterial cell mutating resistance against that phage will also block other phages uh, in, the, in the thing. And so we can imagine that that could indeed inform decisions on phage cocktail because then we know which phages are easily uh, resistant or evolved resistance against, let's say. So we know that those phages will not be very good together because the bacteria has just to make one mutation and that part of the cocktail is gone. The bacteria has become insensitive. to it. I see. And probably that question ties up with this next one here is how promising is using the prediction model on yet uncultivated phage, just getting the metagenome? Yeah, that's something that we haven't looked into yet. Uh, the problem is that we also need to collect uh, infectivity data. And there is a lot to learn to be learned. Now, for sure, there is a lot to be learned from metagenomics data. For example, one of the things that you find in, in metagenomes are these, these CRISPR information. So you can see these, these CRISPR arrays in those uh, metagenomes. And so you can infer from that which phage could have infected those bacteria in the past. That's something that we've also been uh, looking into is to predict, in a sense, uh, putative interactions, which is not something that we have verified in the lab, but we have evidence that at least this phage was able to interact with this bacteria at some mm. point. And this would be, uh, metagenomes are a great source of information for that because they are huge. Um, you have information about species and you can readily uh, analyze their CRISPR content. I hope that that answers the question. So you mean that you can already have an idea of what bacteria interacted with what phage based on the metagenome, right? Just looking at these CRISPRs. Yeah. Well, you have an idea at least of what are the types of phage that you could find in that right. species. Of course, the problem with metagenomes, it depends a lot what people mean about it. If it's uh, a deep metagenomics, then you can ask this question. If it's not, then that might be more difficult. I see. So you information about the species uh, readily available. You have these metagenomics assembled genomes that you can definitely parse for um, CRISPR region, but you might not have them. And then it becomes a question of whether or not you can actually assign a species to that specific sample you are looking at or piece of genome, sorry. Yeah. 
there's there's a question now about the the phage genome. It's an intelligent question, but I'm going to tag on to it um, a really naive question, and I'm never afraid to demonstrate my naivety. Does a phage? The first question is my own. Does a phage have an epigenome? That's the first question. And then the second question about the utilization of the phage genome in your predictive analytics. Have you considered or utilized um, certain stretches of the genome, uh, for example, KMERS, rather than annotated genes um, uh, as you develop your models? Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's, a, that's a different strategy. Let's say the KMERS strategy is definitely useful because you are generating a lot of, of potential KMERS and you can use them to make associations, of course. We haven't gone down that route uh, yet. Um, but uh, in, for, with respect to your question, indeed, we do use the annotated features of the phage, and we try to, uh, to annotate them very carefully. Phages can be annotated chromatically, but we also have uh, curated annotation. And uh, concerning your, your first question, I'm, I'm not so sure. Um, so there is no true, hi, uh, if I may, um, there is no true epigenome, uh, but you do see between phages certain hotspots uh, regions within the genome which are much more variable, uh, which are much more in the foreground in terms of phage evolution and have a higher mutational rate. Indeed, and, and I don't know if that would include also uh, just base pair modifications. Uh, base modifications, I guess that's also a, a potential uh, epigenetics change, and, and this is used indeed by the phages to avoid restrictions. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that probably that question tags along with this next question here from the chat. Uh, could core genes that'll have... The, sorry, that'll be the sorry. last question. Oh. Uh, we're, okay. we're, we're out of time, but one more. Yeah. So Please could try. core genes have predicted power if phage and or bacteria taxonomic range was expanded? C can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Yeah. So could core genes have predicted power if phage and or bacteria taxonomic taxonomic range was expanded, not strange, not, not strange, but maybe genus level. That's a good question. I, I am not a hundred percent sure. We do suspect that there would be some uh, core genes that once mutated do have an impact on phage infectivity. But at the moment, we are not looking so much into that because these core genes are present in every isolate and in the modeling technique that we are using. Uh, the fact that they are present makes them undiscriminative. So we can't really use them as a feature to discriminate between the infection of different phages. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time, but thank you so much, uh, Cedric and Rob, for that. That was really interesting, fascinating work. Um, and so uh, uh, we want to thank you once again. Uh, stay tuned, uh, everyone, for our next series of talks. Um, we'll be uh, advancing care through uh, genomics uh, speakers' topics, including uh, artificial intelligence, genomics of kidney disease, and a collaboration with Mayo Clinic Labs on the new horizon of gen genetic testing. So stay tuned. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a good day Thank or you. evening. Bye-bye.